there. He's happy enough here if you've spoken to him. I'm from Wales, so what I'll try to do is try to speak a bit slower uh, so that you can all understand what I'm saying. So if you do have a Bible and would like to turn with me, it's Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. We'll just be looking at the one verse. I should be quoting it quite often, so it should just maybe lodge in our heads and in our hearts if you don't have uh, a Bible with you. So Revelation, that's the last book in the Bible, chapter 3 and verse 20, and it says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. We know that God will bless the public reading of his words. This is the Lord Jesus speaking here. Behold, I stand at the door. That's the Lord Jesus. The door we're going to say for now is the heart of every human being. You know, the Lord Jesus is actually speaking to Christians here. But what we're going to do, we're going to apply it to the gospel message. Because these Christians, these Christians didn't really know what they wanted from life. They were described as lukewarm. They, they kind of wanted the things of God, but they kind of wanted the things of this world. Maybe I'm speaking to someone in the audience tonight where you're not, you're not quite sure exactly what the purpose of life is, what the reason for living is. And that's what these Christians, that's what their problem was. And so we see that the Lord Jesus, he's standing at the door and knocking. So the Lord Jesus has a purpose for every single one of us in our lives. And he desires to come in if we will let him in. And he desires to dine with us, to eat with us. And us with him. He desires to have fellowship. He desires to have friendship. He desires to know us and us to know him. And so we'll go down uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, part, uh, bit by bit, and we'll just take some lessons from there. So the first thing that I want us to see is that God is calling for us. The Lord Jesus, whom we believe to be the Son of God, God uh, become flesh, God become man, is standing at the door of our hearts. He has made the distance, he has traveled the distance, he has made the journey to stand at the door of our hearts. And it says that if anyone hears my voice, well, to, in order to hear someone's voice, they have to be speaking. So we see that God is calling for us. He has made the journey, he has traveled the distance, and now he was calling for us. You know, my Bible tells me elsewhere, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God. And there is no other. This is what God is desiring from mankind. This is found in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah. He wants all of mankind, all men, all women, all boys, all girls, all children, everyone, everywhere, to turn to him and be saved. He longs for it. But you may say, oh, that's in the Old Testament. You know, the God of the Old Testament is very different to the God of the New Testament. I've read parts of my Bible and that's true. But let me tell you, the God of the Old Testament is the same God as the God of the New Testament. This is what it says in 1 Timothy, who will have all men, all men and all women, to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, God is the same yesterday, today and forever. In my work, we sometimes have to sit these, these, these quizzes and we call them personality quizzes for now to see exactly what colour you are. I'm not quite sure of the scientific um, evidence behind it, but to see what colour you are, whether you're an extrovert, an introvert, etc., etc. But, you know, depending on how I wake up in the morning, probably will influence whether I'm more excited for the day, so I'm an extrovert, or more, I want to be left alone for the day, so I'm more introverted. But, you know, not so with God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his desire, the knocking at the door of our hearts, has never changed. So he longs for all men to turn to him and be saved. He longs for all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And there's something I want to emphasize here. It's anyone. It's everyone. It's all peoples of the earth. There's no one who is too bad for God's grace. And there's no one who is too good, too righteous, too perfect, that they don't need it. God wants all and all need God. Maybe we just don't recognize that in our lives as of yet. You know, how do I know that God longs for mankind to come to him how do i know that god wants people to be saved besides the word of god well firstly it is the word of god i believe with all of my heart that the words that i read to you there yes they were penned by a man who lived two thousand years ago but they are the words that god told that man to put on these pages that when we read the bible we are not reading words of 
someone's mind that they have just put on pages and hope to be true. We are reading the very words that God would have mankind to know. That when I read, behold, I stand at the door, that is God talking in the first person through John who wrote the book of Revelation, but he's speaking in the first person. I believe with all my heart, and there's evidence for it, that this book was written by man, yes, but th uh, through man, yes, but ultimately by God. But secondly, if you are maybe a slightly in doubt in regards to God having written this book, well, we can see it by actions. You know, there's a phrase in the world, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. But you know, God, reverently speaking, there's no greater person who walks the walk. There's no greater action in which he displayed that he longs for all men and all women to come to him. And he's shown it so clearly at the cross of Calvary. You know, we believe from the Bible that Jesus is the son of God. And from the Bible it says that he is the well beloved. But even not looking at the Bible, we know historically speaking for a fact that the Lord Jesus lived on this earth 2000 years ago. And there was multiple witnesses who were willing to lay down their lives for the truth that they had seen, that the person of the Lord Jesus was truly the Son of God. Historically speaking, you can look into it yourself, that the disciples were willing to sacrifice and lay down their life. Those who had cowered in fear when they took the Lord Jesus, because they believed that when the Lord Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, the Son of God died for you and for me. The Bible says God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved you might be asking why is the reason that god is at the door yes he, he longs for us um to have fellowship to have communion with him to restore what was broken well what is the reason that he is there why why can't he just come in to the door why can't he just come into my heart we know there's a big problem and the problem that all humanity shares is the problem of sin you know the bible describes us in this way and it's very serious serious matter it says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. When maybe more, more modern language, dead in your disobediences and sins. We keep the word sins there for now. You know, you may say, Lloyd, I'm alive. You know, I'm living, I'm breathing, I'm eating, I'm sleeping, I'm alive. Yes, physically, every single one of us here looking around, we are alive, physically speaking. But the Bible is looking spiritually speaking. The Bible describes mankind in their normal state as dead because that's what they are. That's what we are towards God because of our disobediences and our sins. The Bible says again, for the wages of sin is death. You know, I work for, funny enough, Lloyd's Bank. OK, I don't know. I don't know how I ended up in Lloyd's Bank, but I'm, I'm in Lloyd's Bank. OK, and at the end of the month, I've signed the contract. I work X amount of hours and I should receive Y amount from them. I put in the time, put in the effort, and I deserve the money that they have promised to give. You know, I'm not, I'm not a greedy person, but I do need that money in order to feed myself, to feed my wife, and to keep a home above our heads. Otherwise, um, the, I mean, the bank is the one who the mortgage is with. They take the, the house off me if I didn't pay the mortgage payments. I, I require my wages. But you know the seriousness of scriptures here, the wages of sin... What we deserve, what we have earned, what we put the effort towards, sin, is death. And that death isn't just physical death. That death is everlasting death in hell, the lake of fire. You know, you might ask the question, what is sin? I do, I do children's work often, and we would say sin is all the things that we do wrong against God. But trying to make it even simpler, trying to make it relevant that we understand what it, it is that we do that's wrong against God. It's knowing what is right. And choosing that which is wrong. You know, when we were born, and I have a, a young niece, so I need to be careful. When, when, when I look upon my niece, you know, she knows that it's right to obey her parents. She's been told certain things. Don't touch the fire, I'll burn you. Uh, don't eat too many sweets because that's bad for you, etc., etc. But, you know, I'm sure if the parents went looking, maybe she'd go into the cookie jar, even though she knows that she shouldn't. You know, each and every one of us, I'm sure many times, have been faced with a situation where if I lie, I can probably get out of the situation if I tell the truth, there might be a hard conversation, there might be punishment or whatever it might be. And you know, you have a split second to decide, am I going to choose what I know to be wrong or am I going to choose what I know to be right? And what I learned from my niece is that no one needed to teach my niece or me when I was younger or any of us when we were younger to disobey our parents or to lie. We were always told the exact opposite. We were told, always tell the truth, 
always listened to your parents. No one told us to disobey our parents. And yet, because of what's in us, because of sin, because of our disobedience, because we are dead, spiritually speaking, we knew how to do it naturally. No one needed to teach us. And you know, the Bible says that the law is written on their hearts. The law of God is written on their hearts, where their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. You know, if everyone was pressurizing you to do something, but you knew what was right, you would feel no guilt if you chose to do what was right, even though everyone is pressurizing you otherwise. But if you knew what was right and you chose to do what was wrong, we receive something within ourselves. It's called guilt because we know that we have done wrong. And you know, we might not have disappointed anyone else. We might not have hurt anyone else, but we know within ourselves that we have done wrong. Why? Why does it matter? I've done wrong and it's affected no one. Well, it's because the law of God is written on our hearts. Yes, it might not have affected anyone else, but it's affected God. God hates sin, but God loves the sinner. And that's the other reason that God sent his son into the world to save the world. That yes, there's this massive problem of sin that must be judged because God is a righteous God. But you know, he didn't want to judge the sinner. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So God had this great problem of our sins, our disobediences, the fact that we were dead and he would need to punish this. You know, he did not long to punish it. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked, is what the Bible says. And so he sent forth his son into the world to take the place that was rightfully mine and rightfully yours. You know, you may sit there and say, but I'm a good person. You know, I've, I've tried my best throughout my life. I've given to charity. I've maybe gone to Africa and helped there. I've, I've donated. I've been as good a person as I can be. And, you know, I'm not here to tell you that you're not a good person. But the Bible does say that there is none good, no, not one. I'm sure what you've done in your life is far better than what I could ever accomplish, naturally speaking. But the problem is my standards here. But God's standard is infinitely higher. God says, for all have sinned and fallen short of his glory, of his standard. Because when your standard is perfection, how can any of us reach it? So we all have this problem of sin. And you know, that problem that's common to all of us, it's a massive problem. Because that problem stops us from having a relationship with God. It stops us from having a home in heaven. And ultimately, it does condemn us to hell. Because God has provided a way from hell and destruction and towards heaven and a fellowship and a relationship with God. But it's only through the person of the Lord Jesus. You know, it's interesting that I said that we are spiritually dead. How can God make alive that which is spiritually dead? If this is, if we are dead, how can God save us? Well, this is the work of God. This is how we can stand at the door and knock and how we can receive him into ourselves. For with God, nothing shall be impossible you know i believe with all my heart that god created the world in six days he spoke it into being with all of my heart i believe that to be true but you know even though i believe that to be true i also know for a fact that god couldn't save us through speaking a word through doing an action with his hand even though he has all this power he couldn't save us in any other way except through the person of the lord jesus why because god is described as righteous or well, the Bible says that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. So what that means, okay, if you are just, we think of the justice system, we think of a judge. If a criminal comes before a judge and they're found guilty, then it's the judge's job to condemn or punish that, that person. If he was just let free, we would call it injustice, okay? So God must needs punish sin because he is perfect and he is just. So you have this problem that God is righteous and must judge sin. You have this solution that God is love and wants sinners to be saved. And so he is just and he becomes the justifier. How? Well, that is the cross of Calvary, my dear friend. At the cross of Calvary, God would come down and live 33-ish years on this earth. And he went there for you and for me to bear the punishment that we could never pay. There's a simple children's chorus. I probably quoted it last time I was here. I love quoting it i owed a debt i could not pay he paid a debt he did not owe you know that is the ultimate showing of love it says that while we were enemies of god christ died for us while we were haters of god while we insulted his name christ died for us 
And a key point that I want us to think about is that if there was any other way, if there was any other way except for the well-beloved Son of God to die on the cross of Calvary, God would have taken it. If we could earn our way to heaven, if we could do anything of ourselves, or if there was any other way that we could get to heaven and have a relationship with God, God would have taken it, but there was no other way. You know, the physical sufferings of the Lord Jesus, if you read the accounts of the Gospels, they used a whip on his back. They pierced his hands and his feet with nails. They plaited a crown of thorns and rammed it upon his head. They spat upon him. They mocked him. They plucked hairs from off his cheek. But, you know, all of that physical suffering, which is beyond my understanding, having, having been hung on a cross at Calvary, you know, the cost of bearing your sin and my sin on that cross far exceeds, is far greater than the physical sufferings of dying on the cross of Calvary. Because it says that he was made sin for us. He bore all the judgment, all the wrath of God on the cross of Calvary so that you and I could enjoy life. Ephesians says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Anyone who is in heaven right now, the only way that they could get there, they would point to the Lord Jesus and they would say, it's all because of him. There will be no boasting in heaven. We wouldn't want to be in heaven if there was boasting. There will be no, I'm here because I gave X amount of charity. I'm here because I volunteered 20 years. There's none of that. It's all because of the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus would say concerning himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to heaven, uh, comes to the Father, comes to heaven, but by me. And so God shows his ultimate showing of love in that he sent his son to die at the cross of Calvary. And you know, while he was on the cross of Calvary, while all these people were going by and hurling insults, and they had shouted, crucify, crucify, and they had put the nails through his hands and his feet. Do you know what the Lord's response was? My response would have been to mock them back. My response would have been to look upon them with the purest of hatred. You know the Lord's response. The Lord's response was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, the Lord came because he loved the sinner. He hated the sin. We can see that on the cross of Calvary. He hated the sin, yes, but he loved the sinner. And so he said, Father, Forgive them. Forgive them for placing the nails through my hands. Forgive them for spitting upon me. Forgive them for insulting me. Forgive them for using the Roman nine tails to make my back look like a plough field. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. No, there's no one like the Lord Jesus who I can commend to you. There's no one that I can offer who's better than the Lord Jesus, because he is better than the best of all humanity has ever had to offer. And so before I close... I want us to think he's knocking on our hearts. He's calling out for us to hear him and open the door. How do I open the door? How do I open the door to allow Jesus in? How do I open the door so that I can have a relationship with the Father and a home in heaven? He's standing at the door of our hearts. He's done all the work at the cross of Calvary because he cried, it is finished. And he was raised again the third day so that we can have salvation. What hard work must I do now to open the door so that the Lord Jesus can come in? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. Boy, is that it? Is that all I have to do? That is all we have to do. We have to put aside self. We have to realize that there's nothing that we can do to earn our way to heaven. And we have to rely totally and completely on the grace and love of God. Recognizing that when the Lord Jesus went to Calvary, he went for my sins. He went in my place. And to believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. And then the very last point I want us to make. God is calling. You know how to open the door. How will we respond? You know, here's my voice that opens the door. I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He longs for that. But you know, it takes an action to open a door. If I knocked on your door wherever you may live, you would have to come to the door and open it. You have maybe three choices. You can come and open the door. You can go when I knock and you can lock the door, barricade the door. Or, you know, you could just not go to the door. But the two outcomes are always the same. No matter what choice you choose, the two outcomes are always the same. Either the door will be opened and the Lord Jesus would come in 
or the Lord Jesus would not come in. Whether because you barricade it, whether because you lock it, whether because you take no action, any inaction, any sitting on the fence, well, that's a rejection of the person of the Lord Jesus. He's done all that he can in saving our souls. He just asks for one step for us to take, one action for us to take, and that is the step of faith. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe has been judged already. So inaction, doing nothing, sitting on the fence, that is not good enough. That places us as a rebel against God. And then the last point, don't delay. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, we're here today and we're gone tomorrow. There's been a news article about the woman who's 45 years old down in England. And she and her, and her dog, and the spaniel, has been running around and everyone's wondering where she is. You know, the husband and the children would not have expected her to not be there when they arrived home. We, we don't know when our lives will be demanded of us. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And so we must be prepared for any outcome. Pilate asks the crowd this, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? I'm just going to pose that question to you. What will you do then with the person of the Lord Jesus? Will you take an action, a step of faith, and open the door and receive him unto yourself? Or will you do nothing? Will you reject him? Because that's what doing nothing is, and be lost for all eternity in our sins. God longs for us to be saved. He's done all he can. Now he demands one thing. He demands a step of faith. Thank you very much for listening.